very unfortunate actually that I see in many masajid uh, this problem where the especially big masajid we have these problems small masajid we're okay alhamdulillah over here but uh, we're talking about in the bigger masajid where you have mashallah many people coming and many variety of people coming right when you have many people coming you have many variety of people coming now when you have many variety of people coming you often have people who do not know the correct sunnah when it comes to uh, attending the jama'ah so what happens usually I've seen in many masajid where the jama'ah has started and the people they are coming maybe slightly late to the salah the imam has uh, started the salah and they're starting new rows even though the row in front of them there's still many gaps right and as we are going to see right the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what did he say how do the angels row up yutimmuna as-sufuf al-awwal they complete the first rows and then they start another row right so this is how in another hadith the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam he talked about the, the 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 way we row up for salah it resembles the angels so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in another hadith he says that um it's part of a longer hadith he says ju'ilat sufufuna ka sufuf al-malaika what does that mean that our rows have been made like the rows of <coughs> of the angels. the angels right the rows that we line up they resemble the way that the angels they line up when they worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when they are doing the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right so this is something that we must bear in mind and the reason why the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is comparing and and informing the sahaba radiyallahu anhum of the similarity of us rowing up and the angels rowing up in a similar fashion is to show the importance right if the angels are rowing up we are resembling the angels right and that should add uh, a, 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 a level of sweetness to the salah a level of concentration and focus it should increase our focus in salah because we are we should be thinking that these this is how the angels row up so i must resemble the angels when it comes to lining up and ensuring that the lines are complete the the the, the line in front is complete before i start a new row the very important etiquette of salah and then the the, the second thing that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said he said wa tarasuna fi saf that the angels they encourage each other to fill in the gaps to stick together the word yatarasuna it gives the meaning of for for a building a building is made of bricks or stone yeah this is how the bricks are firmly together yeah they are stuck together this is how the sufuf should be in salah right filling in all the gaps and as we're going to see there are many ahadith pertaining to this so this hadith is teaching us how many lessons you can say three lessons number one the fact that the rowing of salah it resembles the rowing of the angels number two the way that the angels row up for salah is that they complete the first rows before starting a second row and thereafter the third benefit we are taking from the hadith is that they line up in such a way that they fill, fill in all the gaps and they ensure as much as possible that there are no gaps in between the two individuals that are praying or whoever is praying in that particular row so these are the three benefits that we are taking away uh, from this first hadith of this chapter the next hadith عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لو يعلم الناس ما في النداء والصف الأول ثم لم يجدوا إلا أن يستهموا عليه لاستهموا The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم He mentions in this hadith that if the people knew and we've covered this hadith before um, in the chapter of Adhan yeah, Who was here when we were doing the chapter of Adhan? Was anyone here? You were here, but you just forgotten. That's why you're not putting your hand up. Yeah, you actually tell me no, no one was here. Yeah, mashallah. Every every week we have new people coming, even though I'm seeing the same faces. Right. So we covered the the virtue of adhan, and one of the virtues of adhan that we mentioned was this hadith, that if people were to know the reward in calling for salah, and a safful awal. Yeah, as-safful awwal, the first row, and then the only way they would have competed with each other to such an extent that they would have drawn lots. Who can explain to me what does drawing lots mean? What's drawing lots? 
Yeah, yeah. Like, you pick the right name, Abu Jah. Abu Jah. Abu Jah, but something. Okay, so it's basically like when you write, uh, you know, you get a piece piece of paper and you write people's name on it, yeah? Muhammad, Zaid, Khalid, and you know, Ahmed, and so on and so forth. You write everyone's name. Whoever wants to give the adhan, yeah, maybe we should do that here. Yeah, <laughs> Every, Everyone write their names. And then if the Prophet said, even if they had to do that, they would have done that. Write their names down and then you pick a name, right? Is known as istihan, drawing lots. Okay, so they had a similar method uh, back at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not telling us to actually do this, right? He's telling us the extent that people would have gone to if they had known the reward that is give, that, that is in giving the adhan. But anyway, we've talked about the adhan in the chapter of the, the, the virtues of adhan. The second is asaful awal, the first row. If they knew the reward in the first row, they would have gone to the extent of drawing lots. Yeah? Because of how much reward there is, they would have competed with, with each other in attending the first row, in being in the first row. Now, one thing beautiful about this hadith is look at the link between a nida, calling of the adhan, and a saf al awwal, the first saf, the first row. Why did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa combine between the two? Because in order for you to get to the first row, you need to be early to the salah. You can't expect to come, you know, when the Imam is about to say Allahu Akbar, and then you expect to have a place reserved, mashallah, directly behind the Imam, which by the way, we're going to speak about, right? Who should be directly behind the Imam? Um, so in order for a person to attend the first row, he needs to come early. When he comes early, he is either going to give the adhan, if he is eligible to give the adhan, or he is going to listen to the adhan. And we talked about listening to the adhan, yeah, the importance of listening to the adhan and the reward of listening to the adhan. And when you repeat after the mu'addin and when you recite the dua, we spoke about the ahadith and the virtues pertaining to that, right? So you can see they go hand in hand. And nida and asaful awwal, calling for the prayer and the first row. Because when you hear the adhan, usually the person is very early to the salah. Right? When I say very early, I mean 15 minutes. Nowadays, 15 minutes is very early right, to the salah. And that person often, he will be on the first row. Right? However, it's very unfortunate that nowadays, people, even when they come early to salah, they will be sitting at the back. Yeah? Usually the youngsters who, mashallah, I don't know what's happening in this generation. Every youngster who's at the age of 14 and above has a back problem. Yeah, and they have to lean. Yeah, subhanAllah. And mashallah, our uncles, they're still going strong. Yeah, they're still going strong. They don't need any support, mashallah. They're always on the first row. Yeah, we've seen this many times. We come early to the salah, we see people unfortunately not taking benefit of this hadith. Now, the objective of me mentioning this is not to point fingers that oh, you, you're the one I saw you yesterday, you know, sitting at the back. Right? We're not pointing fingers at no one. This is introspection. Think about yourself. Right? As in, many people, they will sit at the back even though there's no one in the masjid, right? The adhan has been given, preparation is being, uh, is taking place for the salah, and that person is still sitting at the back. Whereas, subhanAllah, it's literally a golden opportunity. What would a person do if there was a chest of gold here? Would he still be sitting at the back? He would be chasing and fighting and competing with, with, with anyone else in the masjid to get that chest of gold. So similarly, there is a chest of reward that is, that is placed on the first saf, right? And we must show importance to this. To such an extent that, you know, we have to come very early for the salah because of how eager we are, we are in attending the first, the first saf, right? So this is what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. In the next hadith, again narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu an, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, خير الصفوف الرجال أولها وشرها آخرها وخير صفوف النساء آخرها وشرها أولها. Right? The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said the best rows of the men are the first and the most evil. Now evil doesn't mean that there's no خير whatsoever. What it means by شر هي is that it is not the best, it is the least best. The least best is, for the men, is the last row. 
Whereas for women, it's the other way around. Women who attend the masjid for salah, it's the other way around. The best rose for them is the last. And the worst of them is the first. Now let's, let's analyze this hadith. We know about men, right? We know about, okay, why is it that the best row for men is the first, the first row? Because of the hadith that we've just mentioned. Yeah, because of the rewards. And because generally speaking, even though nowadays, subhanAllah, we're living at a time where we don't even know what gender is anymore. Right? Allahu Akbar. We don't know what a man and a woman is anymore. Allahu Akbar. Right? These are times that we're living in very con uh, uh, confusing times, subhanAllah. Right? So, why is it that the, for, for men, the first row is the most preferred? Okay, we've got the reward aspect of it. But generally speaking, if you analyze the ahkam al shabiyya the Islamic legislations, you will find that many of the ahkam, they promote men being outside. Being outside of their houses. For example, the amount of emphasis that the Messenger of Allah Sallam mentioned in the previous chapters with regards to attending the jama'ah. Right? We spoke about the ahadith. Very, very important ahadith. Yeah, the importance of attending the jama'ah. And so, so this is the, the, the nature of, uh, of men in Islam is that they should be outside. They should be at the forefront. And when it comes to rowing up in salah as well, they should be right at the front. They should be competing each other. Who can be at the very front of the row? Okay? Well, as for women, because they are women, and for obvious reasons, I don't need to state the obvious, the best rows for women is right at the, the back. Why? Because it is more concealing for them. Right? And the muhaddithin mentioned, not only that, but because they are going to be furthest away from the men. Right? They're going to be furthest away from the men. And that would mean that the, the men will not get distracted. Yeah? And there is, no, there is a, a, a lesser chance for the men looking at the women. And thereby distracting them from salah. Okay? So this is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said that the best rows for women is the last row. And the least... Uh, the, 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 the worst row you can say is the front row for women whereas for men it's the opposite but again unfortunately nowadays I wouldn't blame you on the the gender dysphoria that we have at the moment but uh, nowadays unfortunately it's the opposite even for men isn't it for men now even even for men now it's like you know they want to stay at the back yeah as in it's like subhanallah we are imitating women Right, even though nowadays, unfortunately, in the education system, this is something praiseworthy, right? But uh, Islam is very clear on this, right? We want to imitate women, subhanallah, right? By being at the back, the men, they should be at the front. So, why is it then that we are finding, especially the youngsters, you know, I honestly believe this is due to confidence. There's confidence issues. Yeah, and I've noticed majority of the youngsters, I'm not saying all, okay, and no offense to anyone sitting here. But majority of the youngsters, they have this issue. Yeah, they have this issue. They have this issue of lack of confidence uh, and, uh, you know, uh, being, being shy when it comes to things that they're not familiar with. So maybe they're not familiar with the surroundings of the masjid and because maybe they lack knowledge and so on and so forth, they are shy and they shy away from being in the front row because maybe someone might tell them to lead salah, right? And they think, you know, I can't lead salah to save my life, right? I don't want to do that. I'd rather hide in the toilets. Can you see? So, subhanAllah, this should not be the case. Okay? Boys need to be confident. But not overconfident. Confident does not mean arrogance. They should not be proud. Confidence means that they should not hide away and shy away from these noble things that we should do. Right? That should be part and parcel of our lives. Okay? So, it's very important for youngsters in particular, especially during these summer holidays, very important that we not only attend the masajid, that we come early to the masjid, we come early to the salah, and we attend the jama'ah, and when we come early to the jama'ah, we find space in the first row, as close to the imam as possible. However, there are certain important etiquettes that we're going to look at, inshallah, in the next hadith. And that next hadith is... The hadith of Abu Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu. Not Ibn Mas'ud, Abu Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu. He says, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يمسح مناكبنا في الصلاة ويقول استووا 
ولا تختلفوا فتختلف قلوبكم ليلني منكم أولو الأحلام والنهى ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم Abu Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu, he says that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, very often he would wipe our shoulders whilst we were in salah. So whilst we were praying or whilst we were about to pray, so in, in jama'ah, right, and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was about to start the salah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we find this in other ahadith, that he would actually go round and inspect the rows. He would go round inspecting the rows, and sometimes he would even take his arrow and ensure that the rows are straight, as straight as the arrow, right? The Messenger of Allah used to do that. So this hadith is telling us that sometimes the Prophet he would touch the shoulders of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, ensuring that they are straight. If he saw that, you know, one companion was slightly ahead of the other, he would adjust them by, by wiping their shoulders, i.e. by touching their shoulders and moving them physically, right? And then he would tell them, istaw, that straighten the rows. And, and be upright when you are standing in salah, be upright. And then he said, Wala takhtalifu. Don't differ yourselves in the in the in the rows, i.e., make sure the row is straight. Yeah, so a person wala takhtalifu means you should ensure that no one in the row is out of line. Right? No one in the row is out of line. And then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu mentioned a reason behind that. He said, if that happens, that the rows are crooked. Your hearts are also going to differ. Imagine the lack of straightening the rows, it leads to the hearts being divided. Now, the Muhaddithun, they talk about why. They say that if the believers can't even unite when it comes to something outwardly, how are they going to unite when it, when it comes to something inwardly? If they can't unite when it comes to straightening the rows and they're, they're all united, yeah, physically, i.e. they are all in one straight line, then that is going to have an effect on their affairs outside of Salah as well, right? And this is what will happen, as in it is going to have a spiritual effect. And disunity is going to creep in the Muslim Ummah. And aren't we finding that today? Wallahu a'lam, it could be because many people are not paying attention to this, right? So this is something very, very important. When it comes to lining up, we have to ensure that the rows are very straight, okay? Ensuring that the shoulders are all aligned, the feet are all aligned, the knees are all aligned. And even some hadith mentions that, uh, that the necks should be aligned as well. They should all be in a straight line, right? Have you ever seen, for example, uh, armies of certain countries, or any country, and you see them on a parade, yeah? Very straight line, yeah? An army, you will see them, in a very straight line okay and they're all marching and they're all in sync this is how the rows in salah should be very very straight you know subhanallah one thing that is noteworthy is at the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they never had you see these lines that we have here yeah, you know on the carpet this is meant to aid us in in doing what straightening the, straightening the rows right even though subhanallah the lines that we have in our masjid mashallah they're quite big yeah, brothers, mashallah, have very big feet. Yeah, so that's why they need big lines. Yeah, but in other masajid, you see a very thin line, and they will say, Make sure your heels are upon that line. If everyone's heel is upon that line, the line is going to be straight. But look at the irony we have all of these facilities, yet we find people instead of putting their heel, they put their toes on the line, right? And they don't know, as in, it's, it's like we've forgotten, as in, where is the heel? Right, then they think, okay, heel, where's that? Is it, is it this part of the feet, that part of the feet? And you will still see people, subhanAllah, the rows won't be straight. Whereas at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they didn't have carpets like we have today. Yet, subhanAllah, they would be very, very firm when it came to standing straight in salah. Right, the rows being straight in salah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam really emphasized this. And then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the latter part of the hadith, he mentioned another very, very important etiquette. And that eti etiquette is لِيَلِنِي مِنْكُمْ أُولُوا الْأَحْلَامِ وَالنُّهَا Who should be behind the Imam? This is the question. Yeah? Who should be behind the Imam? As in, is, should there be a certain order of people that are behind the Imam? Or can it be anyone, anyone and everyone? 
So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said, لِيَلِنِي مِنْكُمْ Which literally means, let those people be directly behind me who are أُولُو الْأَحْلَامِ وَالنُّهَا People who are, have reached the age of maturity and people who have intellect. Yeah, Nuha literally means the ability to discern between truth and falsehood, between right and wrong. A person with logic, right? And then the muhaddithun, when explaining this hadith, they talk about how this is also in reference to knowledge as well. This is also in reference to knowledge as well. That the ideally, the person with the most knowledge after the imam should be directly behind the imam. Right? And then the Prophet said, Then those who are next in terms of status, and then those who are next in terms of status. Meaning, let's say we had a very good variety of people, where you had the Imam of the Masjid, and then you had students of knowledge, you had other ulama, you had other, uh, other knowledgeable people that were there, Hufad and Qurra and so on and so forth. Those are the individuals that are most worthy or that should be directly behind the Imam. Right? Then the people who are next in line in terms of knowledge, age, piety and so on and so forth should be after them. And then so on and so forth. Right? In other words, children should not be directly behind the Imam. Why? Because multiple reasons. Number one, number one, children being children, they may mess about directly behind the Imam. This would be a means of disturbing the Imam. This would be a means of disturbing the entire Jama'ah. Which is why when we study other ahadith, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will place the children right at the back. Right? So, and, and we learn this from other narrations where the Jama'ah were, were split up into three sections. There were three sections to the Jama'ah. You would have the men at the front with the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Sahaba were all at the front. Then the children would be behind the men and then behind the children would be the the women all right generally speaking this is how the division was very organized okay so they would, the men would be there first and then there would be the, the children at the back and then behind them would be the women now one may ask okay so why is it then that the the people of intellect and the people of maturity should be directly behind the imam because they are after the imam most fitting to be the Imam. What does that mean? If the Imam, for example, nullifies his wudu, then something called istikhlaf needs to take place. Istikhlaf means what? That you will have to drag the person who is behind you and he will have to take over while the Imam goes and performs his wudu. And now he is now the substitute Imam. Understand? Istikhlaf must take place. So what, for example, inshallah this will never happen, but if I was to break my wudu in salah, whoever's behind me, yeah, I'm gonna pull them forward. Right? If they say, oh, I can't lead, why are you standing there then, ya akhi? Yeah? Understand? As in, I'm not putting anyone off from standing behind me, I'm just uh, <laughs> mentioning the uh, etiquette, inshallah, yeah? As in, we encourage people to, to be, be worthy of leading the salah, inshallah. Tayyip. So, this is, this is how the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, he used to organize the rows and this is what he taught because there could be a situation where the person directly behind the Imam may have to take over. Now if he is not ahal, if he is not worthy of taking over that position, then what? He shouldn't be there. Shouldn't be there. Make sense? So this is ideally, in the ideal situation. Now I know there are many arguments now and people will say, okay, what if there is no one that is ahal of the Imam? Uh, we, uh, and we do unfortunately have these scenarios in, in many masajid today where majority of the people cannot recite the Quran correctly right? and as a result they are not worthy of leading the prayers طيب. so in that situation obviously it's unavoidable but as much as possible we should try to recognize people of virtue people of knowledge and try to push them forward when the time of salah comes now this does not mean that uh, the, the entire first row needs to be reserved for the ulama and the imma only Right? We should still try to be uh, competing to attend the first row. And this should in fact encourage us, not dissuade us, encourage us to seek knowledge. 
being people of the first row, I know it sounds, uh, it sounds a bit negative, but it's a bit like a club, right? The first row club, in the sense, not that, you know, you have to pay a membership to be part of the first row club, no. But the, the membership is that you should be people of knowledge. Make sense? So if you want to be from those people who are recognized as the people of the first row, then be from the people of the first row, meaning possess the sound knowledge and understanding of the deen so that you are eligible, if you have to, to take over the prayer. Make sense? So this is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. He said, لِيَلِنِي مِنْكُمْ أُولُوا الْأَحْلَامِ وَالنُّهَا Right, so once again, who should be directly behind the Imam? People the people of knowledge. And from the from the uh, age age gap, you can say, or the age groups that we have, who should be directly behind the imam? Age. The men, yeah, the men who are of age, of intellect, of knowledge, and so on and so forth. Where should the children be? At the, you can say at the back, right? Because we don't have women that are are at the at the physically at the back of the masjid. But where should the children be? Right, at, behind the men. behind the men. And then where would the women be if the women were in the same wall? Yeah, behind the children, khalas, right? So this is how the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would uh, organize the jama'ah. Yes, little man. Uh, what if the guy, um, what if you have to drag a person, does the guy still have to continue the surah that you were saying? Oh, yes. Well, he doesn't have to technically, as in, as long as the imam, that's a very good question actually, isn't it, right? As in, let me, let me, let me, let me share a joke with you. If if I was to say, for example, Walla and I broke my wudu, the person who's taking over does he have to carry on from the mud? Uh, <laughs> can you see? So look, as in when it comes to uh, istikhlaf, it's a whole chapter in fiqh. Yeah, they talk about how you should do it, what should the person do, and so on and so forth. We're not going to go into details. However, when it comes to taking over, if he knows the surah that is being recited. Which is why, ideally, whoever is hafil should be right behind the Imam. Yeah. Because wherever he's reciting, Alhamdulillah is hafil of the Quran. He'll carry on, right? And which is why, you see, being an Imam is not easy. There are many things to consider. There are many, many things to consider. And maybe one day we'll talk about, you know, uh, uh, the chapter of, uh, of Imamah, right? And uh, uh, it's not just about leading the Salah. Right? As in, when our teachers would train us to, to become, to, to, to lead the prayers and when they would teach us, they mentored us in such a way that one of the most important principles of imama is to take care of the followers. To do what? To take care of the followers. I.e. to be considerate of those people who are behind you. So, for example, if there are sick people behind you, if there are elderly people behind you, if there are people who are in need, right, and so on and so forth, right? So all of these things, the Imam must take into consideration. Understand? So it's a, it's a very big responsibility. Uh, even though many people, mashallah, out of, their, out of their keenness, they are very eager to lead Salah. But one must understand the great responsibility of leading Salah. It's, not, it's, it's no joke, right? Uh, 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 and there are many ahadith that talk about the great responsibility that the Imam has. Yeah, the Messenger of Allah sallam, in one hadith mentions, Al-Imam Mudamin. Al-Imam Mudamin. What does that mean? That the Imam, he is liable, he is responsible for the followers. Yeah, meaning that he must take care of the followers. One day uh, he reprimanded Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu. Because one day Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu in Isha Salah, right, he, he recited a very long surah. Yeah, so people started complaining. Yeah, that because Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he would lead a separate group of people away from Medina. And these were people who were farmers and they were working all day and they were tired. You know, in Isha Salah, they just wanted to quickly pray Isha and go to sleep. So Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, he would start Surah Baqarah. Mu'adh ibn Jabal, you know, Surah Baqarah, Bismillah, let's kill everyone, man. Huh? Subhanallah, so they complained to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What did the Prophet say? Did he, did, did he scold the companions who were complaining? How dare you complain? It's the book of Allah. It's Isha Salah. No, the Prophet called Mu'adh and he said, Afatanun anta ya Mu'adh? Strong words. Afatanun anta ya Mu'adh? Are you causing fitna, O Mu'adh? Meaning, by you doing this, you're going to drive people away from the jama'ah. 
Because not everyone is of the same level of Iman. Not everyone is of the same level of, of, of uh, patience. Not everyone is of the same level in terms of their commitment. Just because you're free and you've got nothing to do tomorrow, doesn't mean the person next to you is free as well. He might have an early shift, he has to wake at 4 o'clock in the morning. Be considerate of the followers. The more diverse the followers are, the more difficult it is to be considerate. Because you have a very diverse you know, a group of people. The point being is, coming back to the point inshallah, istikhlaf, <coughs> the person who is next worthy in line to become the imam should not be standing at the back, should be standing right behind the imam. Because if the imam makes a mistake, that person will correct. Now if the, if the, 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 the shaykh or the, or the hafiz or the, the, the so you can say the, the deputy imam, if he's standing at the back, and poor Imam is stuck, he made a mistake in Salah and he doesn't know what, what verse is next. And the Shaykh is right at the back and he's shouting, screaming his head off, but the Imam can't hear. Now that's not a good you know, situation to be in. Makes sense. Right? So, but if the, if, the, if the person is right at the back, then he doesn't even need to scream. Right? He, he just needs to say it very softly and the person will be able to hear. And he won't become a scene. Right? It's not going to become like, a, like an argument, a back and forth. طيب. So this is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said لِيَلِنِي مِنْكُمْ أُولُوا الْأَحْلَامِ وَالنُّهَا The people of intellect, the people of maturity, they should be directly behind the Imam. Okay, and this is how the rows should be organized. So what we are taking away from this hadith, a few etiquettes that, to summarize, a few etiquettes that we need to bear in mind when it comes to these hadith. Number one, the first etiquette is Complete the row in front before starting another row. That's etiquette number one. Etiquette number two, make sure you fill in all the gaps. Yeah? Make sure you fill in all the gaps. Very tight. It should be very firm. Such, to such an extent that if a person was to try to barge through, he would struggle to barge through. Right? Uh, I don't know if you've seen, subhanAllah, you know, sometimes when attacks take place in certain masajid, right, in certain countries uh, where you have, you know, right-wing extremists, uh, they come into the masjid and they try to attack the Muslims while they are praying and they try to in particular attack the Imam yeah, because the Imam is the guilty one right? so what do they try to do? they try to, they try to break through the sufu but they struggle they eventually do but that stops them and it alerts the rest of the people in time so that they can stop this individual make sense? I remember there was a video a few years ago um, of Masjid Nabawi where the Imam of Masjid Nabawi, uh, Sheikh, Sheikh Udayfi, Hafizahullah, one of the most senior Imams uh, in the Haramain, uh, and he's been leading for many, many years in, uh, in Al Madina. He was leading the Salah, and there was one guy who wanted to attack him. I think he, was, he had uh, some mental problems, uh, or maybe some jinn possessions, whatever, Allahu Alam, but he started screaming, and, uh, and he, tried to, he tried to break through the Sufuf in order to attack the Imam. Sheikh, Sheikh Hudayfi. Now obviously those of you who have been to Umrah you'll know that in Mecca and Medina they'll, they'll have guards yeah, that are stationed around the Imam because of this reason because there are many crazy people out there that may try to attack the Imam right? so this person he tried to do it but because the, the rows were very firm and you know when you go to uh, Masjid Nabawi it gets very packed out at the front of the Masjid the closer you are to the Imam the more cramped it is so the Sufuf are very, very tight, very hard to penetrate them. This guy, he tried and he succeeded with some of the rows. But by the time he got to, the, uh, to anywhere near the Imam, the police managed to catch him and took him away. And that just got me thinking, subhanAllah, look at how much hikmah there is in lining up. So, much, so many wisdom that we can take, so many benefits, even when it comes to security for the Imam, right? There is benefits even to that level, security for the Imam, right? So make sure you line up, inshallah. Yeah, you need to keep me. You need to have my back, inshallah. <laughs> Anyone tries to attack me, unless the person directly behind me tries to attack me, then then you know then the angels will protect me, inshallah. <laughs> right. So this are this is the second etiquette. Yeah, that you must uh, keep ensure that the the gaps are filled in. Number three, we said that the best rose for men is the beginning, the first, and the best rose for women is. The last, okay, and then we mentioned the next etiquette is that uh, the person that is directly behind the imam or those people directly behind the imam should be the people of intellect, knowledge, 
and the people of maturity, the children should be uh, delayed or put put to the back. Okay, for for the reasons that we for, uh, for the reasons that we mentioned. Okay. Uh, the next uh, chapter that inshallah we are going to look at uh, probably next week now is regarding Babu Fadl Sunan Al Ratiba Ma'al Faraid Wa Bayani Aqaliha Wa Akmaliha Wa Ma Baynahuma The virtue of Sunan Rawatib Sunan Rawatib means those optional prayers that are tied with or that come directly after or before the Faraid, the Fard prayers. Yeah? So the, those sunan that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught that a person should pray either directly before the fard or directly after the fard. These are known as sunan rawatib or sunan ratiba. Okay, so inshallah we're going to talk about this. What are those sunan rawatib and what are the virtues of those sunan rawatib? And we're going to inshallah look at uh, each and every one of them and explain them inshallah in some detail باذن الله تعالى next week may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in